Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for behavioral neuroscience. In this one, it's going to be part two of the structure of the nervous system. In this one, we're going to talk all about the brain. So in this chapter, we are going to talk about the subdivisions of the brain. Then we're going to transition to the forebrain, the telencephalon, the lobes of the brain. We'll look at the limbic system. We'll look at the diencephalon the midbrain, and finally finishing with the hindbrain. So let's break the brain down into subparts. So first we'll talk about the three major div divisions of the brain. You have the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. When we're talking about these, we're going to look at then dividing them up by subdivisions, um, you can also look at what ventricles are in each of these parts. So in the last lecture, we talked about ventricles. So in the forebrain, you have the lateral, which would be the equivalent of the first and second. So the lateral ventricles and the third ventricles. In the midbrain, you've got the cerebral aqueduct. And in the hindbrain, you've got the fourth ventricle. Then when we're talking about the subdivisions, so we're going to talk about the telencephalon. The diencephalon, those are both in the forebrain. Then in the midbrain, there's the mesencephalon. And then finally, in the hindbrain, there's the met metencephalon and the myelencephalon. Um, mainly, we'll talk about that last one, but we'll talk about all of these because they break down. In the telencephalon, there's the cerebral cortex, the basal ganglia, and the limbic system, which we will focus on. Then in the um, diencephalon, there's the thalamus and the hyperthalamus. Finally, in the midbrain, there's the tectum tegmentin. Te te I can't say it today, but the, the point is, is we're not going to really go into that. But we'll, we'll talk about it very briefly, but it, we're not going to go into it. But in the hindbrain, though, we've got the cerebellum, the pons, and the medulla oblong oblongata. Um, those we will talk about. So we had this picture in part one, but really we were more looking at this picture as a way to cut, uh, basically look at how we cut the brain in half. So we look at it, but now we can actually start to see some of the things that are going to come in and be relevant to what we're talking about. So we're going to talk about things like the white matter and the gray matter. We're going to talk about the fissures. We're going to talk about the, the, the gray matter, the cortex. We're going to look at all of these and, and look at the different things that are going on with them and what's going on and what they do, in a sense. You can also see the ventricles here. The ventricles are open because if you remember from part one, the ventricles are where cerebral spinal fluid is produced and, and transported. And then we had this slide from the first set of slides, looking at the sagittal view, the sagittal view, the view from the side, specifically in this one, the mid sagittal view, the, the point that divides the brain in half. And from this, we'll be looking at some of the various different things, um, the limbic cortex, uh, the pituitary, the pons, the cerebellum, the medulla oblongata, you've got the midbrain, the thalamus, the corpus callosum, which we'll mention briefly. There's a lot of things from this that we are going to talk about and even more that, that we're not going to talk about. If you didn't hear me say it in the first set of slides, one thing that I think is definitely the case with this chapter is that there are too many terms. Um, some of these things will come up later in the semester, so I'm not going into them in great detail here, simply because if I threw all the terms at you, we'd be here all day with me just repeating term after term after term. So we are going to look at some of these, but we're not going to necessarily look at all of these now. We will later, though, look at every single one of these. Let's start with the forebrain. So the forebrain is made up of two components. One of those is the telencephalon, and the telencephalon is going to include most of the two symmetrical cerebral hemispheres that make up the cerebrum. It's going to include the cerebral cortex and the sensory cortex. Um, the other one that we're not looking at here, so that what you see in 
blue or teal or whatever you color you want to call that is the telencephalon then you've got the diencephalon down at the bottom and that is one that we will um, talk about in a bit so let's look at the primary sensory and motor regions of the brain first we're going to start with the primary visual cortex this is in the the back of the brain back here in the occipital lobe which we'll talk about later um, this is it receives the visual information so the the information comes from the eyes goes to there and then it's processed from there the next is the auditory cortex the auditory cortex is going to be over here on the side um, below the other two the primary somatosensory and the motor cortex and this is what de deals with auditory information the next is the primary somatosensory this receives information from the body senses from the different parts of the body another thing that the primary somatosensory does is it, it allows us to um, integrate our senses and that you can see here and then the final one is the motor cortex and this is what's directly involved with movement and that is just in front of the somatosensory and these two are closely linked where you receive information about the body and where you control the body are basically tied directly together they are one is right in front of the other um, as we said in the first lecture our, the way our hemispheres work is for the most part the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body so everything you see here where it says feet trunk hands fingers face lips those are exactly equal on the other side but it controls the other side of the body you can see here some interesting things like the calcarine fissure which is a a large fissure that's in the primary visual cortex um, this basically allows for the visual cortex to have more surface area something else we'll talk about in just a little bit um, and basically this this these are these primary regions uh, the the last thing that I didn't talk about is you've got the central sulcus the central sulcus divides the somatosensory and the mortar cortex it, it divides them but it the, there is neurons that go across it that allow them to communicate but it is something that is a dividing line between the two now we talked about the motor cortex in the last slide but there's something i want to add from this slide and that is that that more than just the motor cortex um contribute to motor control you have the motor cortex which we just talked about the primary motor cortex here you also have the premotor cortex which is going to to deal with more of um movement related things then you have the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex itself these are also due to movement but these are also due to there there's also other things that go on in this like decision making and rational thought so and when it comes to movements and stuff like that that's going to be related to that the prefrontal cortex is where that activation is going to start i said i'd talk about the lobes so lobes is something that gets a lot of attention like an in intro and other classes and we are going to talk about the lobes in here but the lobes are basically regions and since we are interested in more specifics than just regions we are going to talk about the regions but it's basically going to be something where we'll, we'll refer back to at times but it, it's something to just talk about kind of in passing so the frontal lobe that you have here the frontal lobe is on the the front of the the, the head um and this is responsible for a lot of different things like planning and executing behavior so this is where that motor cortex is the motor cortex is on the rear end or the dorsal end of the the frontal lobe 
Then you've got the parietal lobe, and the parietal lobe is, is going to be dealing with the somatosensory information. So that primary somatosensory cortex is on the, the front of the parietal lobe. It is touching the primary motor cortex, but it's on the, the front or the rostral end of the parietal lobe. That one was here. Then let's talk about the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is the easy one. It's where the primary visual cortex is on the back, and it is responsible for, um, for basically processing visual information. And then finally, you have the temporal lobe, which is on the sides, underneath the frontal and the parietal lobe. And this is one where you're going to have a bunch of different information that's going to be in the temporal lobe that we're going to look at, but mainly auditory, some visual, and we'll look at the various different things that go on there later. And it surrounds the limbic cortex, as you see on this second one. Let's look at the association areas. So, like I said, um, you've you've got what's really important in the brain is integration. So that primary somatosensory cortex, you get um, the you get some associations there. You get some parts communicating with others, but it's very important that the brain can communicate information to other parts of the brain. We have to integrate information. If you have a damage to one of your association areas, you may be able to understand what someone's saying, uh, but you might not be able to then translate that into action or various different things like that. If you're asked to point to something, you may not be able to point to it because your brain cannot associate what you're hearing with your body movements. So we have a bunch of different association areas in, in the body. Um, the, the, somatoser the somatosensory association is, is back here. It's up against the primary somatosensory cortex, and this is going to in interpret and integrate somatosensory information. You've got the auditory association and the visual association cortexes down here, as well as the visual association cortex in the occipital lobe. These are going to in integrate visual and auditory information. And then you've got the motor association cortex in the frontal lobe, which going, is going to associate the, the motor movements of our body with um, the, the different information we're processing. So these association areas are just as important as the primary areas because these association er areas allow it to communicate with other parts. Okay, let's look at these lobes individually for a little bit more. Um, at least the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobe, as I said before, is, is responsible for a few things such as planning behavior, decision making. And again, we've got the frontal lobe up here. Um, and with the frontal lobe, um, what we're, we're interested in is things like the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex, it's in front, it's the front part of the cortex. Um, it's what you've got here, and it basically integrates and interprets information from other areas of the cerebral cortex and turns that into planning behavior. It is It makes decisions. It makes judgments. Uh, it's the part of the brain that's responsible for basically a lot of the things that make us human, a lot of the things that, that make us individuals. Um, we have to... to when we have things like impulse control, that is something that's in the prefrontal cortex working on. When we have things like um, taking risky behaviors, the prefrontal cortex is taking care of that. So when it comes to the prefrontal cortex, it is the, the, the part of the brain that involves a lot of what makes us human. Also in the prefrontal cortex is that primary motor cortex, and this is what's going to execute behavior that we already talked about, and the motor association cortex, which is going to send signals to the primary motor cortex and integrate it, integrate the, the motor cortex with the other parts.
I've mentioned this a few times, but let's look at this, and that is lateralization of the cerebral cortex. What does lateralization mean? Lateralization means that some functions of the cerebral cortex, of the cerebral hemispheres, are lateral, lateralized. They are located primarily on one side of the brain, and the way these work is how it crosses over. So one part of the brain is, is operating the other half. Um, so, and when we look at this, some things that, that are lateralized, some things that, that are specific to one side or the other, um, not necessarily when we're talking about control, because when we're talking about control, you get that cross lateralization. But when we're talking about things that, that tend to happen on one side, so our left hemisphere has more to do with analyzing information, whereas our right hemisphere has more to do with simple synthesizing information. Um, what does this mean? Um, and is this a universal? First off, we'll answer, is it a universal? No. Some people's brains are switched. Some people's brains do analyzing on both sides. Some people's brains do synthesizing on both sides. The point is, is for the most part, the left hemisphere does more analyzing and the right hemisphere does more synthesizing. Um, Relating to that, as I said, you've got cross representation. You've got the left hemisphere controlling the right side of the body, the right hemisphere controlling the left side of the body. Um, some other things that are interesting, the left hemisphere is responsible for speech and the right hemisphere is responsible for emotion. Again, both pick that up some, but the left is primarily going, speech is primarily going to come from the left and, um, and Emotion is primarily going to come from the right. And there are different things that go on here, um, but we will talk about that later. Dividing the two hemispheres is the corpus callosum. It connects the corresponding parts of the left and right hemispheres. Uh, interestingly enough, if you have your corpus callosum cut, it doesn't necessarily end up killing you. Uh, it actually, people can survive it. People who have really bad seizures, who have no other options can get it cut. However, if the two hemispheres can't communicate, it does lead to interesting things that occur with the body and with things like movement. Um, basically, when you get to a point where you, you can't control your left hand, your left hand is doing something different than what your rational thought is thinking about, things like that. But those are extreme cases, those are exceptions, not the norm. Next, let's look at the limbic system. The limbic system is located around the medial edge of the cerebral hemispheres, meaning it is um, towards the center. And the this is going to contain various different structures but the limbic system is mostly involved with learning, memory, and emotions. So you're going to get things like the, the basically your emotions, how you feel, what you feel, when you feel are going to come from this. Learning, memory is really big in this. Memory is, is, is huge with this. Um, later in the semester, we'll talk about cases where people have damage to the, their limbic system, specifically the hippocampus. Let's bring all three of those up. The limbic cortex, the cingulate cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus, specifically damage the hippocampus who can't form new memories. Um, so one thing with the limbic system, this is basically what we consider the reptile brain. This is, we consider it that because this is the part of the brain that is really old, meaning you look back evolutionarily and th this part of the brain is found in many species all the way back um, very early on when you get to vertebrates, they still have parts of the limbic system. So the limbic cortex there, the cingulate cortex, it, it does regulates emotion based on sensory input. The amygdala it, it leads to fear and stress. And finally, the, the hippocampus is memory. So damage to the hippocampus leads to things like amnesia and ability to form new memories.
So now let's talk about the basal ganglia. So this is a group of subcortical nuclei in the forebrain. If you remember what I said nuclei was, nuclei is going to be clusters of neurons. So it's a subcortical cluster of neurons in the forebrain. It inv is involved with the control of movement, and it has the striatum and the globus pallidus. The striatum is composed of the, the caudate nucleus and the putamen, and it's basically part of the dopamine pathway. And degeneration here results in symptoms of Parkinson's disease. If you recall from before, I said that Parkinson's is related to a deficiency in dopamine. Well, this is one of those regions that with Parkinson's you, you have degradation of, and it causes some of those, those symptoms. The globus pallidus is something that, that makes a connection from the striatum to the substriatal nigra in the brain, and it regulates motor inputs from the lower parts of the brain to the primary um, motor cortex, and damage here can lead to things like tremors. So the other major division of the forebrain is the diencephalon. And the diencephalon is, is made up of the thalamus and the hypothalamus, and it surrounds the third ventricle. Let's look at those, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So the thalamus is basically a, it looks like two, two nuts, two grapes, two berries, however you want to look at it, but it projects information to specific regions of the cerebral cortex and receives information from it. It looks like a chamber, so thalamus refers to a chamber, and it acts as a relay station for sensory information. Sensory information comes in through this and then gets relayed to where it needs to go. Um, so it processes sensory input and sends them to the appropriate areas of the cerebral cortex. And as you can see here, it is underneath the basal ganglia. The hypothalamus is then a, another type of chamber, um, hypo meaning small, so smaller chamber, and this controls the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine systems. So we talked about those in the autonomic in the last chapter, or in the last lecture. The endocrine system is going to be what's responsible for hormones, and we'll talk about that later. But so the endocrine system produces and controls the secretion of hormones throughout the body. And this is responsible, the endocrine, the endocrine function is then responsible for um, the four Fs, fight, flight, feeding, and reproduction. I'll let you change that last one to an F. Um, so we've got fight, flight, feeding, and reproduction. And this is basically the things that these hormones are controlling throughout the body. Within here, you've got all of these different little regions. You've got the, the hypothalamic nuclei, uh, the pituitary, which we'll talk about later, the mammilla, mammillary, if I can pronounce it right. Um, if you look closer, you've got the posterior pituitary, you've got the anterior pituitary, um, you've got all of these different regions that are, that are part of it that make it up that we will look at later as things that are relating to hormones. So when we get to the next chapter and we're talking about psychopharmacology, we're talking about hormones, we're going to look back at the endocrine system here. So let's look at that a little bit more now before we get come back to it. Look specifically at the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is the bulb-shaped gland that's that's right there near the hypothalamus. Um, and this is the one where hormones are released. So all the different hormones that, that are released into the cells of the hypothalamus, 
The intercapillaries and are conveyed to the anterior pituitary gland where control the secretion of hormones. The hormones of the posterior pituitary gland are produced in the hypothalamus and carried there in vesicles by means of axioplasmic transport. What does it all come down to? It's basically a part of the body where hormones are produced and transported. And the, when we get to hormones, we will talk about that more and look at how the, the hormones here are affecting all of the parts of the, the human behavior. Okay, let's real quick talk about the midbrain then. So the midbrain, there isn't a lot to talk about here, but there's a few things. We're not going to have separate slides for them, but let, um, we'll look at each of these individually. Um, we've got the periaqueductal gray, which is going to be a, a deal with things like species typical behaviors. Um, this is going to control the various behaviors that are specific to species, to an individual species, to that species. Um, the next is the substantia nigra. Um, this itself is going to deal with motor coordination, and it connects the striatum to form the, uh, the dopamine pathway we were talking about before. So this is where you get degradation in this is responsible for the symptoms of Parkinson's. The next is the ventral tegmental area. The ventral tegmental area connects the nucleus accumbens to regulate reward. So it's, it has to do with reward systems and it connects the prefrontal cortex to regulate higher cognitive functions. So this is a basically the thing that's connecting to reward pathways and higher functions. And this, this is one of those pathways that is highly related to when you talk about things like classical conditioning and, and operant conditioning and how those shape behavior while well, it's going through this. Then you have the superior colliculus. This is due, due to visual reflexes and then the inferior colliculus which is due to which is responsible for auditory reflexes so seeing something out of the corner of your eye and making you flinch stuff like that something coming towards your face you flinch that's the superior colliculus loud noises a bang something like that and you flinch that's the inferior colliculus work at work and then finally you've got the hindbrain the hindbrain has three major areas. Um, first is the cerebellum. The cerebellum receives visual, auditory, vestibular, and somatosensory information and information about muscle movements. So the cerebellum is receiving all of this information. The cere another term for the cerebellum is the little brain because it de deals with things like fine motor control. So it integrates all of this information in, and modifies motor control to to smooth out the effects of movement and make them more fine so when you're talking about fine motor control the information is first coming from the motor cortex but then it's going through the cerebellum and the cerebellum is making the movements more fine so people like who have very fine motor movements like um, artists surgeons things like that they've trained their cerebellum to have those vi fine movements The next one is the pons. The pons also is called the bridge, even though it doesn't necessarily look like a bridge. It is um, going to connect the cerebellum to the rest of the brain. So the pons relays information from the cerebral cortex, those motor movements, those sensory information, all of that, to the, the little brain, the cerebellum, and then the cerebellum then processes it. And finally, you've got the medulla oblongata, or just the medulla. And this is going to include nuclei, clusters of nerves that control the vital functions such as cardiovascular system, respiration, muscle tone, um, all of those different things. So this is, this is relating to our, our vital functions, heart rate, breathing, and body temperature. So the, you get that there down below the pons.
Um, there's other things on here, the pineal gland, the mammal mammalian body, I cannot say that today. Um, but this is where you have the mesencephalon. I haven't been talking about the those um, to this point, but this is where that region is. Um, you can see that it's it, this this the hindbrain surrounds the fourth ventricle there in the middle. All of those things we've been talking about are here. Okay. In this lecture, we we talked about a basic overview of the brain. It's kind of funny when I say basic because we got pretty detailed. This is way more detailed than your intro class or most other classes you'll take. But as far as what we're going to look at through this semester, as far as when you compare it to like what doctors have to learn, um, things like that, it was a basic overview. We looked at the subdivisions of the brain. We looked at the forebrain and then the, the telencephalon and parts of that, the lobes and the limbic system. Then we looked at the diencephalon and then we finished with the midbrain and hindbrain. As I said, we are going to go into almost all of these in more detail later. When we talk about vision, we'll talk about the visual cortex more. When we talk about hearing, we'll talk about the auditory cortex more. We'll talk about how some of these things relay information and transfer information when we're talking about those different systems and we'll get more in detail. This lecture is more of an overview. I understand that this lecture was a relatively short lecture. Um, and that is, again, because there's just so many terms thrown at you. I really wanted to split this these lect this lecture into two parts. I could have put them in one and, and done it as one, but I really needed to split it into two parts. Okay, thanks. Come on back.